So welcome and good evening. Nice to see everyone. I'm Peter Henry, Dean of the Stern School of Business, and I'm thrilled to be here with you tonight for an exciting program. It is my honor, frankly, to introduce a member of our Stern family, the former chairman and CEO of NASDAQ, Bob Greifeld. Bob graduated from our MBA, our MBA program in 1987 and has had an illustrious and, and dynamic career since that time. He served as NASDAQ's chief executive officer from 2013 to 2016, that's quite a tenure, and chairman of the board of directors up until May of this year. He claims to be slowing down, but I have evidence to the contrary, frankly. Uh, during his tenure, Bob led NASDAQ through a series of complex, innovative acquisitions that extended the company's footprint from a single U.S. equity exchange to a global exchange and technology solutions provider. Nearly quadrupling revenue, growing annual operating profits by more than 24 times, and achieving a market value of over $11 billion. He's a member of the Economic Club of New York, and most recently, I'm happy to say, the NYU Stern Board of Overseers. Welcome to the Board of Overseers, Bob. We're tremendously proud of Bob's impressive career and delighted to welcome him back to campus to speak with alumni and students this evening. Please give Bob a big round of applause. <laughs> Joining Bob on stage is our own Joel Hasbrook, NYU Stern, Professor of Business Administration and Finance. Professor Hasbrook's primary area of research is market microstructure, the analysis, design, and regulation of trading mechanisms for securities. In addition to teaching at Stern, Joel has served as a consultant to the New York Stock Exchange and the American Stock Exchange and is a former member of NASDAQ's Economic Advisory Board. We are fortunate to have such an esteemed faculty member here with us to guide tonight's conversation and to help us glean some deeper insights. After the talk, I hope that you'll join us as we continue the conversation during a reception right here in this room. So at this time, please allow me to hand the stage over to Professor Joel Hasbrook and Bob Greifeld, please give them a warm NYU Stern welcome. Thank you very much and, and welcome. Bob, I'm going to organize, I, I think we'd like to hear, of course, the NASDAQ years are going to be central uh, to what we want to know about and how you managed things there. But before that, there were, this, there were a few stern years in there, which we're also kind of curious about. But before that was the beginning. Um, an English major, of course, uh, which your parents probably warned you about. I warned my kids about not being an English major. But it worked out OK for you. Where did you get started? So uh, it's a good major. Uh, it was not a complete major. Uh, it's a good undergraduate major. So uh, I get started, uh, I'd like to say, when uh, dinosaurs and mainframes rule the earth. Uh, back in 1979 at a company called Burroughs Corporation, and it was a primarily mainframe computer manufacturer. And uh, it was known as, it was part of what was known as the bunch. He had IBM, and the bunch was Burroughs. Uh, UNIVAC, NCR, Control Data, and Honeywell for a history lesson there. Yes. So we were one of the bunch. And of these, how many are still in the computer business? No, you don't have to. Uh, well, I, I, well, Burroughs. In one form or another. Yeah, well, yeah. Burroughs and UNIVAC became Unisys. Yeah. Uh, NCR uh, boy, is you know, not in the mainframe computer business, but I obviously make uh, ATMs. Control yep. Data, I do not know about, and Honeywell is not in the computer business. So time changes. You, your first function, were you in sales or? Yeah, I came yeah. out of there basically in a sales position, but it was a different time and place. Computers were quite new and what was great about Burroughs and probably the other companies at the time was the training program was quite intensive and rigorous. And you see a lack of this, I think, in corporations today where they take you and you know, put you in a training mode for, uh, for nine, mo nine months and that would complete your education. And then they turned you loose on the customers. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I and I, what I like to say is a, it was a great uh, experience for me in that uh, you know the times changed quite dramatically uh, from seventy nine to eighty nine ninety when I left. And during that time, the thirty two bit mini computer was basically invented by Digital Equipment Corporation DEC. So that started yeah. the the world changing quite uh, dramatically. But I came from a a, a 
background, which was not a wealthy background, and I did very well in my career there and was basically getting the promotions that were available to me and made incremental money uh, you know, beyond what I thought. I had limited horizons at that point in time. So I probably stayed too long in that in environment because the world did change, not just from the hardware, the deck world, but it was the advent of software companies independent of the hardware company. So back in 79, the hardware manufacturer provided you know, the, the software. The, uh, as a freebie, the, as a giveaway. As, exactly. As, yeah, it was a hardware-dominant world and yes. software was a throw-in. I, I remember those years. That, that period also, you would have made the transition from being a staff salesman to being a manager. What do you, was that transition difficult? Well, at, at first it was when you're a young person, you have people who are now seemed, seemed ancient at the time, but are young people hmm. now. You know, if you're 25 and you've got a bunch of 45-year-old folks working for you, I think that part of management initially was more uh, uh, difficult. I'd like to be 45 now, but <laughs> as I said, but I, I would say, you know, not that difficult. And I stepped into it, you know, fairly uh, you know, with uh, you know, fair, fair, fair ease. You know, you had a couple guys that you know, would kind of stare you down in the early days because you were so young. But then you fire them, and then they, other people learn not to do it. <laughs> you know, it's pretty simple. Well, uh, you can't fire all of them. I, no. Did you? Uh, did you try to salvage some of them? Oh yeah, definitely. No, I, 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 in terms of taking pride of what I do, is I like to believe that in my management ranks, I've taken people who've historically performed at a B or B plus level and elevated their their performance, and I, I think that's a uh, true mark of of management capability there. So that's what I think I did, and you know, as I went forward in time, I said, well, how did those people perform after I left? And did you know my teaching stick mm -hmm. with them? And initially, that wasn't so much the case, but better as I moved along in my career. And why did you decide to move on? Well, I, I, as I kind of hinted at, I was probably waited too long in that I was getting the promotion, so I would end up running a you know the sales and service for at that time the Long Island region, and I was a young person. It all felt good. Uh, and from my background, it was quite exceptional. And uh, so I probably stayed there too long, but then it became apparent that there was going to be a 32-bit, a 64-user uh, mini computer that was gonna sell for $100,000, right? And you know, it seems like a lot of money today, which it is, but you know, when we started, you know, the ticket price of the big iron was millions of dollars. So we said, that's there. And margins were gonna decline. And back then, the software business, you would deliver the software on, uh, I'm trying to see the old people in the room. Walter, you're in this category. Uh, 1600 BPI tape or the, 6250. The, the, reels. the yes. reels you see in the movies, yes. right? That kind of thing. So I said, okay, the marginal cost of this software product is that tape, right? And that's a pretty good business, right? There aren't too many businesses that can be there. And I said, I need to get in to the software business where you have the ability to you know, have a, a, a great margin and business model going forward. And you have to understand, you as an employee, your economic success is directly related to the success of the company. Right? If you're in a low margin, low profit business, you're not likely to be making a tremendous amount of money. So I said, I've got to find a company where they're making a lot of money because then I have a greater chance of getting paid a lot myself. And software was just, you know, the natural place to get to. It was it, the future. It was starting to take off. Now, I'm curious, did you think of moving west to California to the Hewlett Packards or maybe north to the DEX or the Data Generals or the well the manufacturers of the Yeah, software? no, not not really. And uh, you know, I was married and kids were on the way and I wasn't presented that option uh, <laughs> to move. But, you know, in New York City, you have a great advantage because even then, uh, you know, it was a place where people wanted to be. So the first, I had ex accepted a job to run the East Coast for a company called Informix, which is a real, yes. was a relational database player back in the time. So I took my first trip to the Valley to meet the Informix CEO 
uh, at the time, Phil White. And so I sensed then the first time, you know, what was going on in, in the Valley. But they needed to come east and they needed to get involved with that marketplace. So it, it never had, you know, had to get that, that close to it. And then you were able to, did you take, did some of your former customers from Burroughs turn up in your Infermix? Well, I never customer t- mix. The, uh, where my life took the, the big turn, and I never actually showed up at Informix. So I'd accepted the job, and then when I was at, uh, mm. at, at Burroughs, we had bid on automating a NASDAQ market maker. And uh, I partnered up with a very small software company here in Lower Manhattan, which had experience in batch RPG programs. Uh, and uh, we were bidding it on our Burroughs mini computer. We lost out to a company called Stratus at the time, which had a nonstop computer. So then I went to grab a dinner with the gentleman. It was like three years later from when we lost the deal and I had been promoted and left. And he said to me, Bob, not for anything, but nobody has automated the NASDAQ market making operation that we bid on three years ago. And in three years, technology had changed quite dramatically because at that point the sun had shrunk the 32 bit mini com- mini computer down to a desktop with the spark 20 I'm aging myself with all these old stories we have to get into current I, times yeah, well, and, <laughs> uh, and sybase a relational database was taking off and in memory sure. programming techniques were developing so you could do a lot more with it so then i said later for informix which is a great job and for my background, you know, to run the East Coast for a dynamic software company was a good thing, but I said, let us take our swing for the fences here. And then we started development of a trading system for NASDAQ market makers. And again, this is 1999-2000, and they're keeping their positions by hand, their, uh, their open orders by hand, and it was kind of insane how behind the times that was. And the only systems that were available to do it were mainframe based where somebody had to spend five to ten million dollars to put it in and we were gonna charge you know, per terminal uh, per month, which is really where the street is wired. So we did that uh, for but a period But you of had time. never been, I don't think, a trader. No. Or been otherwise involved in the securities business. Right. So did they, how did you get them to trust you to automate a business that you hadn't worked in. Well, you know, where NYU uh, dwells into this, when we did uh, that bid for the uh, automation of the system, it was a company called Mayer and Schweitzer, which uh, eventually got acquired by Schwab. I, at that time, you know, uh, we wrote the entire system specs for the system. So, uh, and I was leading that effort, so I knew exactly the functionality that was needed down to, you know, kind of the minute detail. And I had an aptitude, uh, you know, mm-hmm. for that uh, kind, of, kind of thing. Uh, so we had a very clear sense of what had to be done. And, you know, in retrospect, it's quite, you know, looks quite simple, right? And that we would program to bore people, you know, we'd have orders coming in electronically as opposed to on the, over the telephone. And if the order says buy at the market, we'd have a price feed that says, okay, if I'm buying, I get to buy at the offer. And here's the offer from the NASDAQ feed, executed, reported back to the tape. So it would hit up on the screen and send the execution message back and then record the trader's position. So now you it make it, harder, actually, you, you make it, it sounds. You make it, <laughs> it's, I, as I, I describe say, it, it's harder than it is. <laughs> you make it sound very simple, but when things go wrong, it is spectacular crash and burn. But not back then. All right, All right. so the, the, the level of performance in uh, requirements increases, you know, and it increased, you know, kind of quarter by quarter, uh, year by year, as the markets got busier, became more active. And don't forget, you had people who would have an open order file on paper, and they would miss an order by minutes or days, right? I forgot I had that order there, right? So, you know, you, it's a, what your reference point was. But clearly, every year, the demand requirements went higher. And we had to go back and redo our system because we made it, Sybase was a very fast relational database. I thought we were going to get tied up in capital market structure. Uh, we stuff. We're, we're in <laughs> technology stuff. So Sybase was a very fast relational database system. But then the markets were changing rapidly, and you had to move the database into in memory uh, because it just could not keep up. You know the mechanical yes. arm of the disk drive. So we and then we do kind of a memo write 
to disk after the fact. So, you know, that was, you know, something that was changing uh, in real time. So you had yeah. to do a fundamental yeah. change in flight. Now, the human traders that you were working with, cooperating with to develop these systems, how did they, did they sense that their days were numbered? Not back then, no, uh, because, and they, they weren't for a while because the volume, you know, was picking up. We were leading into the dot-com era, right? So if I started in 1990, it was sleepy. I mean, I remember installing accounts in the regional brokers at the time, and 9.30 would happen, and they'd still be reading the paper, right? It's ancient history now. So, yeah. and that led, and by the time you got to the dot-com era, then the thing was frantic. But it really was sleepy in the beginning, got frantic as we went along. Did that help you? Was the early pace slow enough Definitely. that you could learn about what could, what could happen? And I, I, I the, agree with that completely. Right? You know, with uh, the amount of resources we bought, uh, you know, we, we brought to the problem set, uh, would not have been able to address the 1999 issues. It addressed the 90 issues that we were allowed to grow with the market. So then you got into uh, with with that. You had an entree into financial data systems. Nowadays, by the way, we call this fintech. Yes. Finance, technology. Uh, Get a higher multiple from the investors. <laughs> 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 well, also, also uh, returns to the graduating students, too, I yes, think, yes, based, no on their, <laughs> based on their enthusiasms. Um, but at, at, so you had automated a NASDAQ market maker. And did that put you into a position to then go to NASDAQ? You know, uh, it didn't quite work that way. So we, uh, it was getting on to 1999, and the fellow who had the back office system, Carl LaGrasa, was, uh, and he was the majority, with two shareholders, myself and him, he was the majority. He was getting on in age at the time. And uh, so we, you know, it was time to, you know, get him liquid because he had not been wealthy through his life and here he had this asset that was worth money and I'm one of the things I'm very happy with because I wasn't the I wasn't wild about us selling at that point in time but the fact we sold gave him three years to enjoy the fruits of his labor and then he you know the ill and, and passed mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. So that kind of worked out well in retrospect. I'm so happy we sold when we uh, when we did. Uh, so that was happening and then uh, and that was a trigger. And the other trigger was uh, we got, thank God for the NYU uh, knowledge because there was something called a pooling of interest transaction back in the day, all this old stuff, uh, and they were going to go away. And so we had some smart investment banker said, you have to understand, if you're gonna do a stock deal with absent pooling, your valuation is gonna come down uh, for a period of time. So we got acquired by a public company called SunGuard Data Systems, one of the very last pooling of interest transactions that were done, and they were trading in a relatively high multiple, so I didn't know much, but I knew that anything below their multiple would accrete to them, mm -hmm. so we knew what our negotiating point uh, could be, and you know, we did you know, quite well in the exit as a result of that. And then as a unit of SunGuard, yeah. for a few more years? Yes, yeah, so I went to SunGuard, and as I said, uh, I would call would have called myself a uh, SunGuard was a necessary component of me being ready to take on Nasdaq uh, well, for a couple of reasons. One, so we sold uh, ASC to SunGuard. We were 200 people, and then within six months, they had promoted me twice within SunGuard. So now I had thousands of people on a, a global basis. And as ASC, this was kind of your opportunity to do well in life, and and we were going after a niche. So I didn't feel any reason to utilize any of the management skills I got in grad school and just kind of be a micromanager f uh, from hell. And then uh, at SunGuard, and I remember leaving Stockholm, and we had some issues there, and I said, best case, and we had a large office in Stockholm, I'm going to get back there in six months, and I better then, it made me realize I had to have some good management team in there. 
So it certainly allowed me to develop the concept if you don't have the A team mm -hmm. working for you, there's no way you can succeed. And SunGoat also did his acquisitions as a part of their life. So that skill set of doing that uh, was important. And I call SunGuard my positive mentoring phase with respect to being in a big company. And Burroughs and Unisys was kind of the negative mentoring phase. So as I alluded to, I rose to call it mid-level mid management. In Unisys, I remember being uh, in a meeting with the top 100 managers together. And I realized none of us really had any power and uh, any real input to the power. And so why, why pay us? So with SunGuard, it was definitely a more distributive architecture where people were given real power and the company was able to thrive and grow. And there you realized that you just, you had to be a delegator. Yeah, at, at, at it got some. forced into it. Yeah, you can't be in all places at all times. Were, was it difficult making that transition? Were there Finding the right people? Or? I, I, you know, I went, when they purchased us, I thought I would stay for a year, and that would be the proper turnover period of time uh, and get the organization set. And then, as I said, my job was fundamentally different, so I stayed uh, four years, and I look back on it very fondly. And as I said, I could not have done what I did at NASDAQ without the fine-tuning the skill sets I got mm -hmm. working in a senior position in a, in a large company. It was helpful. And along the way, during the Informix years, or the Burroughs years, came the NYU MBA? Yeah. Yes, I went to NYU at night, uh, which I am very proud of. I taught at NYU at night. And I'm very uh, proud that you hopefully taught me and taught me well. <laughs> but I'm too old for that. And uh, I, I realize now I'm older because I didn't live in the city. And so I would have to take the, you know, the subway to catch the train out of Grand Central. And the 920 train was the, the milk run where it stopped at every uh, fork in the road. And so I would have to leave class. Classes got over at 910. So I'd have to leave at 8.50, missing the last 20 minutes of classes. Thank God the professors never did anything last week. <laughs> so it was always a gap in my <laughs> uh, learnings. But then otherwise, if I you know, cut it close, you'd miss the 9.20, and then the next train's at 10.20. Uh, and then you're not getting home till midnight, that, uh, that kind of thing. So it, Yes, it's true for the faculty as well. Yes. So let me ask you <laughs> this. Let me, uh, we are... We are of course, like any major universities, thinking about expanding online. In those days, if you'd had the opportunity of getting your MBA remotely, would you have done all of it online, half of it? Uh, what do you... Well, it's a, we didn't have the option back then. We did not have the did, option. What do you uh, think? But actually, I was there when they just put in the deck 20, uh, 2020, uh, and I tried to get online. They were offering it. I never quite figured it out back then. But you'd have to go in on a Saturday to get in the computer room back in the day. But I would say this. Uh, I will relate it to what I say to folks at work uh, with respect to working at home. And uh, to me, if you work one day a week at home out of the five, it could be a boost to your productivity. But I think it quickly shifts the other way where you get out of touch. You know, in, in a day, you won't lose the kind of the flow of what your department's doing or the company's doing. You do more than that, you lose the flow. So, and then I, I flip on the other side. So I think with respect to what your question is, I think some unlearn learning would be good, but it can't, repl cannot uh, replace the experience of being in a, in, in a classroom, in my mind. So there's some balance you can get to. My guess, if you were to ask me directly, would be, you know, an 80-20 uh -huh. kind of, kind of thing? You have no idea how relieved I am to hear Okay. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so you graduated in 1987? Barely. Uh, barely. I told you. Uh, does, do you have a change of grade form? No, we, it, was, we, it, we wasn't that. it wasn't that. It wasn't that. I had, I, had, uh, I, I had got the 60 credits done, and then you had to get eight credits for your thesis. Now, I, I got promoted up again and had to move out to Long Island. And so now I'm out there, and, uh, you know, I've, you get promotion, you get new responsibilities. So, you know, like a year had gone by, and I said, I'm never going to get the thesis. And then my wife uh, became pregnant with the first child. And I said, well, if I don't get the thesis done before 
my first child is born, there's just no way it's going to happen. I'll be the idiot who took 60 credits and never got the eight credits done. <laughs> so the leaves are falling down in the yard, and I said, either I can rake these leaves or start writing this thesis. And I decided to write the thesis. So the law in the next year was just not good. <laughs> <laughs> But you graduated in May of 1987? Yeah. And in October of 1987, we had the crash. Did you wonder about staying in the finance? Do you remember the crash? Do you remember thinking maybe this finance industry isn't such a good thing? See, I never, I, I don't, I didn't identify myself in the finance industry, and I still don't. And when you look at my career at NASDAQ, and we transformed NASDAQ into a technology company, in, in my mind. And I really got hired by Hellman and Freeman, which we'll talk about, you yeah. know, to transform it in technology. So if you look at the fundamental operation of an exchange, you take away the imprimatur of the exchange license, it's a transaction processing engine. And we hired, you know, some of the best engineering talent on the planet. I'll take them up against any of the, the Google folks. And, you know, we had to architect this thing down to the microsecond response. So, you know, we were, oh, I've always been, in my mind, a, a technology uh, person. And, had, and, and here we on the, on the East Coast uh, qualify that by, say, applied technology, right? Mm -hmm. So we're not trying to build, never tried to build, you know, core system level functionality but take the best of what's available and primarily from the west coast and then apply it as aggressively as as we can well you've called it sort of a transaction processor right but that doesn't that sort of minimize all the other dimensions of running a marketplace yeah uh you you know when you're i'm sure you've tried to make you've made listing presentations to get companies to list and investors to come on board, is can it really be reduced to just a reliable transaction processing thing? No, no, but uh, because one, the charter of NASDAQ in the beginning was different than a standard corporate charter in that we always have to be aware of our obligations to investors. So from that point of view, you're different, and you also are in the eyes of the SEC, it's known as an SRO, self-regulatory organization. So as the, you know, the eyes of the court, you are uh, the SEC, and you have some immunities uh, associated with that. Now, I outsourced the vast majority, but not all, of my regulatory burdens to the NASD, which is now called FINRA. Uh, but still, in the eyes of the SEC, you can't outsource that obligation. It's your obligation. So that will certainly be clear and center on your viewpoint. And as you mentioned, on the listing side, we never outsourced any of that. So we made the decision whether the company is qualified to list. We made the decision if they're meeting their listing standards or would uh, delist them. So that's all real, not meant to minimize it. Uh, but I had half my employees were in technology, mm -hmm. right? that, that, that kind of thing. And that was going to be our sustainable advantage over time, right? The other part of the business is we had to do well. Uh, we had to do it with great respect of our burdens, but it wasn't going to drive us from 500 million to 12 billion in market cap over time. So it was going to be our creative use of technology was going to do that. So you came in in 2003. Yes. What was the NASDAQ that you walked in the door and saw? So what happened was, and so I, as you're getting at the point, I was somewhat an unusual hire, but NASDAQ was part of the NASD, and they desired uh, to be separated from the NASD, move away from the broker-dealer ownership, and become a normal form uh, for-profit company and then a public company and they needed somebody to do that. Now uh, Hellman and Freeman, a leading private equity firm from the Valley, had invested money in NASDAQ, made the determination that the previous CEO was fine for the previous mission but not for where they wanted to go and that's where you know basically I, I came in and the regulatory rules had changed where NASDAQ and NYSE had had monopoly positions on the trading of the stocks they listed. Yes. Uh, something called Reg ATS had happened and Reg a NMS was happening. So all that was becoming a shootout at the Wild West. And you had NASDAQ as a uh, regulatory 
organization with a regulatory culture unable to compete in that environment. So we were losing market share by the day. When I got there, we were losing $250,000 a day. So we had some work to do hmm. to get the ship turned around, uh, that kind of thing. And so I was hired not out of desperation, but somewhat out of desperation. Yes, I remember that the loss of that monopoly trading rights by the exchanges fundamentally changed things. It did. And uh, so you essentially had to disrupt the business from within. Well, we didn't have a choice. I didn't have to sit there and say, should we be disrupted? Because, you know, we were not... It was clear you were going we to be... We were going to be in business for much longer uh, if we didn't do it. And what was remarkable... Uh, most regulators have a clear focus on the viability of the market exchanges. SEC, it, they don't see that as their mandate. We saw that manifest itself in 2008, 7 and 8 in other ways. But So they had no clue what kind of financial position we were in at the time, but you know, mm -hmm. we had to focus on it uh, there. And, you know, so every, basically, you know, every single person there had self-selected to work for a part of the regulator which is an entirely different mindset than saying, okay, we're going to come to the shootout every day and you know, try to eat what we kill. So there had to be a massive transition of, of, of staff to you know, get to where we had to be. Was the SEC right? Do you think markets should be competitive or are they natural monopolies? Well, I would say this. Uh, the transaction cost in the market, as I think you know, is declined over 90 percent. So I, I think you could argue, if you want to argue it, you could have a monopoly and in certain ways have a more stable market, you know, less dynamic but more stable. So you're always playing the dynamic nature versus the competitive nature. So I think, you know, I think we have the right balance and investors have been served for it, served mm -hmm. well by it, that, that kind of thing. How did you change the culture of NASDAQ? In, to become a more competitive uh, force? You know, you have to be dramatic when you first show up. So I think I fired, you know, the three of my five direct reports before 8 o'clock the first day. So uh, the word got out and the grapevine. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, I said I'm not going to put this up for debate. I don't want to waste a minute debating where we're going. I said this is where we're going. You're out, you're out, you're out. And then and then people tend to fall in line mm -hmm. after that. Uh, so the same thing when we went global when I made the OMX acquisition. So then you have a different culture. Yeah, the, you, the OMX is Sweden. Yes, yeah, Sweden, the, Norway, the Norway, uh, Finland. The, the Scandinavian. Yes, where it's very dark right now. Yes. Yeah, so my belief if organizations are going to get tortured over culture, you know, the competition's not waiting. You can't spend any time or effort thinking about that. So when I went to Sweden for the first time, I said, you know, this is, you know, we weigh, measure, and count everything. You're going to, if you're not productive, we'll know. We'll ask you to leave. If you are, you'll get paid more than you're getting paid now. And uh, if this is not the right environment for you, it's not good or bad, right? It's not that our way is better. It's just a different way. And if that's not what you want to be, you know, move along, and if you're going to try to fool us, we'll find you sooner or later that you're not fitting in, and so you've got to be quite rigorous about that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Also at the time, there were, regulation was in turmoil. So you not only had to manage your own internal uh, processes, but you were dealing with the SEC? Yeah, yeah. As they were trying to well, yeah, the, the, the world, markets were changing. And yeah, and there, uh, I once said, and I came out publicly, it didn't help me really. I said, uh, the SEC pace is glacial, but uh, that's probably an insult to the glaciers. Right? <laughs> so uh, so they, they were inequipped you know, to respond in a, a quick fashion. And part of it is, you, know, you got this controversy with the Consumer Protection Bureau. You know, the SEC is five commissioners, right? And you need a majority vote, and they don't like to do 3-2 votes uh, very often. And what's also bad is you have sunshine rules where, uh, you know, the commissioners can't meet informally. They have to meet in public meetings. Uh, that I think two of them can get together informally. You go beyond two, you have to call for a public meeting. 
And so then nothing, you know, then you schedule a public meeting a month in advance. So the world wants to change and they're institutionally unable to move in, the, in that kind of fashion. They could, though, have decreed that markets would be a monopoly. Yeah. And that would have made things. So do you think in that respect they kind of went down the right road? Yeah, I mean, what's, yes. I mean, certainly us, the market's going uh, demutualized because originally the markets were owned by the brokers, demutualizing, and they're going for profit. One, the U.S. was behind Europe in, in this uh, regard, and in many respects uh, behind uh, Asia. So we believe in capitalism, we believe in competition. Uh, it makes it interesting. I wouldn't want to work in a monopoly situation and what do you come to work every day and decide how much you're going to increase the price, I guess, if you own a monopoly. Uh, so, yeah, uh, you don't get a 90-something percent reduction in transaction costs in a non-competitive environment. You don't get a system that go from responding in two seconds to 32 <laughs> microseconds without competition forcing you to do that, right? I mean, we were hitting the limits of what software could do, and so, okay, how do we now have to get into hardware and hardware accelerators? And we started doing the, you know, the uh, field programmable gate arrays. I'm not doing that unless I feel the hot breath of competition on my, on my tail, so. All right. You've spoken about the benefits of this competition, and they're true. I've looked at the numbers, and the costs did come down for customers, and uh, the customers don't always appreciate that, but the cost certainly came down. The downside, though, would be instabilities in the market. In 2000, what was it, 14, uh, Knight Capital, their computers lost over $400 million in one hour. Did you worry that something like that might happen? Yeah, well, NASDAQ. well, it directly happened to us before that with the uh, what's known as the flash crash. Yes. Right. So the way I look at it, and I'll go through it. So the the Reg NMS was established, allowed the markets to compete with each other. Reg NMS was designed by no insult to economists, but a bunch of economists and lawyers in conference rooms. And so whether you argue or not, what they did, they did it. And what they were missing was the engineers behind the scenes. So there was no infrastructure to support a competitive market. So after the flash crash, we got dragged down, the exchanges and us get down, dragged down to Washington where with uh, you know, uh, Tim Geithner and others saying what the hell happened. And then CME and ICE, which were monopolies, say, well, you know, we just shut our market down. Well, the problem we had was we would say at NASDAQ during the flash crash stopped trading and the competing venues didn't have to listen, right? So there was no rules of the road in terms of uh, what, what's now known as limit up, limit down, you know, basically circuit breakers in the market. So the lawyers and the economists, which we were part of this effort, focused on the minutiae of the micro market structure and forgot what I, in manufacturing called design to engineer, right? So we were missing certain things. Uh, so now the markets today are competitive, but today as the listing market, we can stop trading. If the market goes down by a certain percent in a certain time frame, the markets will uh, turn off. If a stock hits a, uh, a trigger, limit up, limit down, that will then have a pause that will replenish, uh, ref, uh, re replenish it. So we had competition. We saw some downsides to it, but that wasn't fatal. It was just a lack of thorough and rigor to build the infrastructure to it. So today we've got a highly competitive market uh, with a lot of infrastructure. Is it as good as having a monopoly in one physical floor? No, you're gonna have more downtimes, more issues with that. But like anything else in life, you gotta balance that against what is the, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, cost of that uh, and the efficiency of that market. So we play with that. Now you think that trading halts are the way to deal with this? We saw with the flash crash, a pause refreshed. Yes. Uh, and, you know, and that was coming from the futures market. Uh, was the pause. So yeah, uh, we, we believe that, you know, you have to, and again, th this gets complicated because as you know, if you pause for too long, right, then like it's like yelling fire, 
and then everybody's kind of rushing to the exit, right? So you get a hit a circuit breaker, hit a circuit breaker, hit a circuit breaker. So it's a proper pause that allows the market to resume enough so you don't build it enough steam. So you got to play with that, right? And so playing with those dials is important. What people sometimes ask me is, all right, I understand why you want price limits on the way down. Why would you want price limits on the way up? Well, same thing. The night algos could have been running the markets up higher, and it shouldn't be that higher, and let the other folks come in there, right? Mm -hmm. Did you worry, though? And people are short. Right? This, uh, the short yeah. sellers want limits on the way up. That's uh, for sure. Yes, uh, uh, that, that's true. People do forget that. Yeah. But investors think of just, of course, people going long. Yeah, the shorts are an important part of the market. But surely, even from the beginning, you must have been concerned with the security and the stability of your own NASDAQ systems. So what happened, when I came to NASDAQ, to let me, I, I criticized the, the team that was there, but what they did well is they would come out with a release once a year, running on tandem mainframe computers, and the systems would never go down. You get new software, you want a new function, a year later you got it maybe six months I'm graduating, exaggerating. ECNs came out with rickety Unix-based systems, would go down every other day for a bit of time. Uh, they put new features in every day or every week, right? So you had old, new, right? And then we lived in a period of time where new was the panacea, and NASDAQ had to respond to that. But now we've hit a point of balance because that new where you're not doing proper engineering, right? Nobody can put in, you know, uh, really code that you can guarantee every day or every week, that kind of thing. So how do you get to the right balance? And NASDAQ had to address the competitive time. And, you know, the life lesson here is the right answer today is not the right answer tomorrow. The, right an the wrong answer today doesn't have to be the wrong answer tomorrow. And you've got to get uh, to, the, to the point of balance there. So you lived a period of time beyond the fact that the people in the SEC didn't put in the plumbing requirements. You also had a point in time where you had a greater, it was a rational move for the competitors to take higher risk of putting additional capabilities into the market in a somewhat untested basis because they would be rewarded with more activity in their market. As the market hit a point of stasis, then the desire and the requirement to have stability you know, became more paramount. So we're kind of halfway mm -hmm. between where we were between the two markets. So initially, competitive pressures drove you to de develop in sort of a piggledy-piggledy. Well, now uh, we call it rapid, you know, they have fancy rapid words. Rapid deployment? For, yeah, we have fancy uh, yeah. words for it now. Uh, 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 yeah, and that, you know, in a mission-critical transaction system to do rapid deployment, uh, you know, you can see how that might not work out sometimes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but Did you have any close calls? We had... Uh, we had a lot of close calls. Uh, so, you know, what's interesting, you could sit here and say, okay, our ARP time, we never engineered, certainly, to be uh, five nines, 99.999. But you would, with a regularly designed system, get to 99.99. But in the world we lived in, in 2015, that little gap, you know, if it comes at 9.30 or 4 o'clock is, you know, quite... Uh, quite dramatic. So yeah, you're always you know living with it. it's it's you know cybersecurity is kind of the extreme version of it. You know you're going to get hit at some point, uh, and in terms of system uptime, you know you're going to get hit at at some point because nothing's engineered to perfection. And if we had engineered, which is old Nasdaq wasn't quite there, but if we'd engineered to triple nines, then we'd be out of business. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, you have to understand what you're customers looking for it. So, okay, if I came out with a system, you know, uh, every 18 months, then, uh, you know, you just wouldn't be there. And then, uh, you, of course, you were with NASDAQ until earlier this year? Yeah. Yeah, 2017. Uh, your present firm, Virtu, is a market maker, an electronic market maker. Um, which some people would probably call them a high frequency trader. That, that's what they are. They uh, that's well, I, that has certain pejorative connotations. So uh, if you're okay with it, that's uh, I'm very okay with it. Uh, uh, but so one is I, I started myself and a partner started a private equity firm, which then raised the equity to allow 
uh, virtue to buy the old knight, which is, you referenced the problem. And then I became chairman of the combined uh, uh, company uh, there. And now we're in the process of integrating the two firms uh, together. So you make markets, electronic markets? Uh, on a global basis, yeah. And any electronic marketplace, right? So Virtu, so Knight was primarily a domestic play handling uh, primarily domestic retail order flow, which they did incredibly well. Virtu, if there was an electronic marketplace, right, they're really trading widgets. So you name an electronic marketplace anywhere on the planet, uh, we're there. Bitcoin? Not yet. Okay. But obviously... Uh, you know, with Bitcoin, uh, you know, there are a bunch of exchanges out there. And, and again, so Virtu does well where markets are electronic, accessible, and deterministic, right? Uh, so we don't do well in over-the-counter bespoke type markets. I still put Bitcoin in that category. But changing gears where Virtu could have an opportunity if the CME, the CBO product, then becomes real, right? So they're launching Bitcoin futures. So this is real time, it's happening. I think SIBO is starting to trade uh, uh, very soon. And if that's a market, then Virtu will be able to use the knowledge from there to possibly go into native Bitcoin markets. We mm -hmm. haven't made any decisions on that yet, but you know, something fun to think about. Are you in other markets, other equities markets worldwide? Everyone. Mm -hmm. No, you name an equity market, we're in it. Right. And so for Virtu, uh, as I said, so I, I think we trade in 180 different markets. Uh, so any electronic market, so we were, Virtu is the only guy who globalized their fundamental market making capability. So in market making, it was, the beauty is it's, you know, it's very simple in that Vinny Viola, the founder of the firm, was a floor broker down the block here. And so what he did in his head in the floor, we basically put into a computer uh, uh, function and then we're to pro there to provide uh, liquidity and in a very simple fashion and Walter knows this very well you know we're capturing a bid offer spread and we're actually trying to capture a piece of a bid offer spread uh, because their cost of clearing is is very low and their volume of transactions are, are, are very high there but we're there to provide you know a market maker is there to provide the they call it liquidity I call it oil you know the grease to allow the markets to, to move in, 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 a, in a fashion there. Now, you mentioned certain bespoke things. Uh, would you, bonds, treasury bonds? Treasuries, definitely. So okay. treasuries trade more like an equity, right? Because it's a deep, liquid, electronic market. That's happy hunting grounds for uh, a, a, a virtue, right? That kind of thing. In over-the-counter derivative, uh, they're not going to do that because right. then, you know, they're they're looking their mean time for holding, you know, is is measured in really uh, how often the bid offer spread changes. So it's it's a it's a quick turnaround there, and that's where you know our systems have to be, you know, very fighting. fast, very very secure. Yeah, and our systems, the way we work, you know, you had a number of the HFT guys are primarily identified kind of as the latency ARB guys between New York and Chicago. So Virtu is never that. I mean, uh, so it doesn't have to be the fastest guy, but it can't be slow mm -hmm. either because then they, they won't get where they need to go. Tell me, and my students ask me this question, is there still a place for human traders? Or should all of my students be taking IT courses for they all should be taking IT courses. Uh, uh, so I would say yes and yes. Uh, so yes, there's a, obviously a place for human traders. And, uh, and so when you think about the virtual world today, you've got pods of technology people uh, with the traders. And the models you develop, as simple as Virtu's market-making models are, they require care and feeding every day. All right, so right now as we sit here, there are Virtu people, traders, with Virtu technology folks saying, okay, what did we learn from the trading activity today and what uh, uh, changes are we mm -hmm. going to make? And so Virtu, uh, last week, you know, we, we put some new things in that tied together the night and the Virtu order flow and that worked very well. But now you've got people on the other, and this is a great capitalist experiment, you have then other trading firms or other banks then responding to the fact that you know you know Virtu did something new and different and really so it's you know it's always a complete they leap. copy you they react oh they to leapfrog you. they they react to us and I wouldn't say copy uh, they react 
uh, to the market presence. You can't do it of the day, but. Do they try to destabilize you, do you think? Is it, uh... I think those people are primarily out of the market, oh. uh, that, that kind of thing. There's the quote stuffing you're getting at, that, oh. that kind of thing. Similar practices where yeah. they just generate noise. You know, they have to realize that, you know, everything's digital, everything's recorded. Uh, so it's, if I'm not a regulator, but to me, and, and NASDAQ, one of the technology business I built was uh, selling those kind of tools to regulators on a global basis. So you can see the footprint of somebody doing <coughs> something. Oh, you yeah. can do the slow motion replay and it's, see what yeah, yeah. yeah, so you know, the NASDAQ tools we built, are, and it was out of Australia, you know, you had, it, w it was pattern recognition. So we had 60 patterns and that would get 98% of it. But now you're getting the next step, and I'm not there any longer, so I don't know if they're still doing it. Uh, but the next step was to get into natural language AI processing, so you wouldn't, you know, the patterns were great, you developed new patterns, but now you want to do dynamic uh, recognition of the data. So that would be the next uh, uh, wave of technology coming. So if you're trying to do something bad in the marketplace, it gets harder and harder not to be seen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I, I'm getting cued to take a few questions in the, uh, uh, if the audience has any. Uh, Laura has a mic and, and uh, yeah. Thank you, I'm right here. Uh, David Rodriguez, alum from the undergraduate college, class of 99. Uh, Thank thanks you. for your time. I have a question around the inherent tension between exchanges trying to create value added data products to leverage the flow on their marketplace with investors concerned around making sure that you're not using their data improperly. Would well, that's a that? good question. I would say, it, one, you're hitting on a controversial topic, but not quite the way you describe it. It's, you know, you know kind of the philosophical question is, who owns the data, right? So Charles Schwab would say, we own the data, and probably the Schwab customers say, wait, it's my data. And the exchanges say, well, we own uh, uh, the data because we aggregate it. So that, that is a perpetual question that's out there. And you know the data business is a lucrative business, and if you decompose exchanges business model, that's the highest margin business uh, they have. So, as a shareholder of Nasdaq, putting my exchange hat on, even though I'm not at the exchange anymore, uh, what we did at Nasdaq because we knew this was a bigger and bigger issue is to try to come up with uh, proprietary products. So right now. Uh, you know, back in 03 to 08, 90 something percent of our data revenue was revenue customers had to have from a regulatory point of view. So right now, if you're trying to place an order to buy or sell a stock, you have to have the best insight quote available to you and the exchanges charge you for that. And that's the regulated part. So when I left, we had 75 percent of our revenue was from proprietary data, data products, which customers could elect to choose or not to use or not to use. So, but that 25% is contentious and then people bleed it in together. So uh, the answer to your question is the exchanges are good people charging fair rates for the data. <laughs> Hi, thanks. I was wondering if you, with changing technologies, if you saw New York remaining uh, the financial powerhouse over the next uh, 20 years and, and secondarily with, um, with at some point we'll have a bear market. <laughs> um, how does that ripple through companies like NASDAQ or Virtu and what do you do to prepare for that? Yeah. So uh, the salt tax is not helping, right, for New York uh, in time, but uh, I, I think the, the finance world is obviously today New York and London and then from the Asia point of view, it's been traditionally Hong Kong. And I think if any center is going to change in the next 10 to 15 years, it's going to be the Asian uh, region as, uh, as uh, Shanghai and uh, uh, the Beijing exchanges become that much more uh, powerful. So I don't see that impacting New York in any uh, way, shape, or form. And uh, New York as a financial center is still on the offense in that we have companies from outside the U.S. list here. And that's kind of a uniquely American phenomenon. So if you're a biotech company on a global basis, you want to list on, on NASDAQ. If you're primarily a technology company, you want to list 
here on NASDAQ. If there's an Israeli company you list here, and Chinese companies that are technology focused tend to, to list here. No other market has that, with the minor exception of London from back in the day with Commonwealth countries, but you see that receding. So I think London has a time zone advantage, where, uh, and I think Brexit will take a long time to impact that infrastructure that's built up. And I think New York's in a very good uh, position, and like I say, I expect changes to happen in uh, in Asia. Uh, you know, with respect to trading firms and exchanges, uh, when the market gets very uh, turbulent, that's good times, right? And that trading volume is directly correlated to volatility. So we look at the VIX, uh, and the VIX isn't the best index, but realized volatility is better. But those kind of indexes will tell you where the volumes are. So we, we were going through the great credit crisis back in seven or, or eight, uh, you know, our systems were redlining. You know, we were doing uh, transaction rates we only tested in, in the lab. And the problem with that is it's a wicked hangover because you see in these, uh, those times the volume shoots up like that, then as the recession hits in, then they stay at a very low level for an extended period of of uh, time affecting their business model. So clearly there will be a recession at some time and then after that initial burst I think the exchanges kind of track the general uh, GDP of the economy at that, that, that point in time. Hi. Um, your successor, Adina Friedman, has said that she'd like to see um, more of the NASDAQ technology migrate to the cloud. Um, one, do you see that as realistic? And two, wouldn't you be concerned about how that will affect Vert Virtu? Well, you know, uh, our, my CIO, my ex-CIO who's still there, has been an early proponent of the cloud. Uh, and the cloud is easy for a number of applications. So NASDAQ built up a corporate solutions business where we had 20,000 corporate customers. Most of that business is on the cloud. Uh, today. Uh, surveillance products are on the cloud today. The pure matching engine, the heart of the exchange, you know, I got a little old on that uh, in terms of, you know, we didn't quite do that and I'm sure we'll get there. Where it makes infinite sense is when you're in less developed regions where they don't have the infrastructure really to support a, a data center, so that's the easy one. So I think the exchange itself is kind of the high water mark with respect to cloud implementation. It will happen. Uh, the Microsoft Azure cloud uh, uniquely now supports what's known as FPGA. Uh, so you can run, you know, those are hardware accelerators that we have to use right now to have the markets run the way we want. So you could run that in, in the cloud. So it's going to, uh, to happen. And once you believe the cloud security and infrastructure is better than what you can build internally, then you kind of flip the other way. So, uh, so the answer is yes. I think, you know, more and more stuff will go uh, to the cloud. The exchanges will be, you know, the U.S. exchanges will be the, you know, the, the laggards of that. Helen Steinberg, Stern MBA 2013. I'm t we're in a very interesting point in time where that, that the traditional companies trying to build on their existing industrial expertise to build up digital tools to using sensors and intelligence. On the other hand, we have IT companies who try to break into the traditional industry and thinking that uh, they can be fast and better than the traditional industries. I'm just curious from your perspective who will win, but that's a less important question. But more important, what are the success factors that you see that determines whether a company from either side will be successful? That's a good question. There's a multitude of answers, but you know, you know companies uh, are successful based upon you know, the culture in the company and the talent in the company. And I don't, I think uh, one of my favorite business books back in the day was Good to Great. And what I liked about the concept, he said, just get the right people on the bus before you know where the bus is going, right? That's pretty radical. So just hire good people and then get them together and figure out where the bus is gonna go from there. So, to, you know, so I don't know who will win, 
But who's ever got the best culture and the best team on the bus, you know, will will win. Nobody has a lock on uh, uh, the future, and everybody has certain advantages and disadvantages based upon where they come from, a legacy uh, point of view. So you know, it's a it's a hard stop uh, there, and you see it across all different industries where companies can adopt. I would say that obviously, if the legacy makes it uh, difficult to move, then that company tends to lose, but it really depends on the, on the team, on the bus. You know, I would say so. you're being generous because your own career has been the success of technology over existing uh, players. I existing agree. players. But you always could think about how the other player could win. Right? Yes. There, there's a path, right? So you give me a deck of cards and you learn how to play it, right? That, that, that kind of thing. And I love the line that, you know, no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy. So whatever great plans you and the team come up with in the conference room, then you get out there and it's, you're going to have to pivot. You know, life is, you know, is going to be a series of pivots. So who's going to pivot better based upon, you know, their, their set of circumstances? You know, we could take generic examples. You know, Walmart's now better using their assets. Microsoft is better using their assets that they had uh, uh, than they might have been five or ten years ago. Okay. Everybody say. Yeah, we have time for one more. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I know that uh, Nasdaq uh, implemented uh, trading of some less liquid products using uh, blockchain. Yeah. And I think it is only the post trade processing, not the actual uh, matching engine. Um, I assume there is a reason for that. Do you think if the actual matching engine, engine was implemented in a blockchain, it would take the NASDAQ or other exchanges totally out of business. No, uh, so uh, how many transactions a second does the blockchain do? Like, <laughs> well, just give us a six, 12, 20. Uh, we do like three million. All right, so he's got a little ways to go. Uh, there, but I did blockchain. We started uh, NASDAQ private market, and that is companies were taking longer to go public, and then they had employees and early stage investors wanted some way to get out. And so we invented that market, controlled the whole ecosystem, so now we can do this in blockchain. Otherwise, blockchain really takes a, you know, takes a village to implement. When you think about the clearing systems, which should be, the clearing system should be in blockchain, right, as opposed to the trading systems, but even that's going to take a long time to get there. So we had, you know, this new market where you can trade your LP interest, essentially, in private companies. We put that on the blockchain, and uh, what was remarkable, and you talk about all the disruption books, uh, so if you buy and sell Apple, uh, buy or sell Apple today, it takes you three days to settle and clear, You're going to two days. Uh, on a blockchain implementation for private markets, we would do the trade, settle, clear, move the money in 10 minutes, right? So this is nothing small companies out in the valley. So that's what technology uh, 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 can do. And they didn't really have a matching engine per se there. So big believer in blockchain for post-trade. Uh, you have to understand how carefully engineered the matching engines are for high volume. Where blockchain could be good is for those over-the-counter instruments, right? I think there's a lot of smart contracts can be developed and are being developed for instruments that don't trade, you know, two million times a second. And I think you'll see that in the next, you know, three to five years. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. And Bob, we have a small token of appreciation oh, for you. A Christmas present. Yeah. <laughs> Is it a tie? Is it a tie? An NYU tie? <laughs> thank you, thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please, don't have a pause,